Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Happy Monday and happy Halloween. Uh, let's talk a little bit about deliverables. Hopefully you're working your way through deliverable nine. As you probably noticed by now, it's quite different from one through eight in that most of the details are up to you. We're looking to see that you're able to apply these three different kinds of scaffolds to make things easier for your user to get started. And we also want to see evidence in the three videos that you submit that you're gradually removing the scaffold. So your system is detecting that the user is getting better at whatever you're asking them to do. And based on the fact that they're getting better, things are getting harder for them, right? You're gradually making the task more difficult or providing less hints, not unlike what we're doing in assignment nine, where we're giving you less hints on what to do, right? Okay. No questions? Okay. Oh, yes. I don't... Okay, I'm just going to say, how cool. long should the videos be then? Like, Doesn't matter. Okay, because I'm trying to think to show I, the scaffolding being removing. Yes. Are we allowed to do video edits? Yes, or? absolutely. You can do video edits as long as, again, the evidence is in there. We can see that your program has detected that it's gotten better, that you've gotten better, and it does something to do that, to to fix that, right? If you're splicing it and suddenly the program shows something different and we don't see any evidence that your program has actually detected that the user has gotten better, that's not what we're looking for. It doesn't need to be very long. You can, you can cut as you see fit. Yes? Um, do you need a description of the video? Like, I suppose it's not necessarily obvious. If you need to, that's fine. So in this case, yes, you can use English text. You can assume the instructor and the TA speak English. That's, that's fine. Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, so we will go over the 10th and final deliverable on Wednesday. You're probably wondering what will happen after the following Wednesday. You will be more or less on your own to fill out the rest of your uh, educational system, and we'll talk about that uh, next week. Okay, so, um, oh, other housekeeping notes. Um, some of you have probably heard about the computer science fair. Um, if you haven't, I highly recommend that you submit your project from this class to the CS fair. There's a, uh, first of all, just by registering, you get a free t-shirt, so that sounds good. Um, first place for advanced projects, which this class would count as, is uh, 300 bucks, and I can tell you that in the previous two CS fairs, the ASL and, and ASL educational system always wins, right? You've got an unfair advantage over your student colleagues in other classes, right? What's not to love about the Leap Motion device, ASL education, and so on? So um, there is a pretty good chance uh, that you can pick up the $300 grand prize. I highly recommend. Uh, that you submit. Even if you don't work, uh, even if you don't win, um, the fair is usually sponsored by a large number of companies. They come, they check out uh, the projects. Some students in the past have been offered jobs on the spot. So this is also, you can also think of the CS fair as a reverse job fair. So you're the one advertising yourself and companies come and, and uh, have a look and see what our students are, are doing. So. The least you can get out of this is a free t-shirt, maybe $300, maybe a good job. So I highly recommend that you, uh, that you submit a project. And the link for the CS Fair, I just dropped it into today's uh, lecture. Okay, so back to lecture. Um, we are now uh, about to enter, we're going to finish lecture 14 today on affective computing. So what is the role of affect or emotion in, in, in HCI? We're going to finish that today, which will finish our discussion, our crash course in cognitive psychology. And we will move on today into lecture 15, which is the first lecture in this new theme on looking outward. So interactive technologies that are out here in the world with us, very differently from traditional laptops and desktops, which are hidden behind a mouse and a keyboard and maybe a webcam, which is the only way they can interact with the physical world. We're starting to see interactive technologies that can more directly sense our world and more directly uh, interact or push back against it. 
Uh, lecture 15 and 16 are pretty short. I've cut out some of the slides from those who are a little bit behind where I want to be at this point in the semester. So we may actually finish 15 today and move on to uh, 16. Okay, so back to lecture 14. Um, we were talking about sort of three different goals of this subfield of HCI called affective computing. The first one is trying to get computers to recognize emotion, right? It would be nice that a system knows when we're frustrated and slows down the interaction or notices when we're bored and speeds up the interaction. We ended last time by looking at technologies which give the impression of having emotion. So Hal gives the impression of having an emotion which makes Hal entertaining. Why would we ever want to do that outside of a movie? I showed you Kismet last time, and Kismet was the ancestor of Jibo when we watched the Jibo video last time. Some of you, uh, maybe it was a good one for Halloween. Jibo is in some way kind of frightening. But assuming you would, did want to buy Jibo, why would you want to introduce that into your home, and why would you want a machine that exhibits or advertises emotions? even though you know Jibo doesn't have any emotions. Better relatability. Relatability, how so? What do you mean by relatability? By appearing more human in some contexts, it allows you to easier, more easily understand certain aspects of it. Absolutely. You can sort of infer Jibo's intent, right? Without Jibo telling you, as the head rotates, you know that Jibo tends to be interested in faces because Jibo tends to look at or attend to faces. So like human attention, our attention tends to be drawn to faces, so we share something in common with Jibo. We're interested in faces, we're interested in people, right? It, it exacerbates our natural tendency to anthropomorphize, right? Or project human-like qualities onto inanimate, in this case, inanimate machines. Okay, so again, once we do this, why might we want to try and create this tighter bond between human and system? Um, because again, once, once we can do that, perhaps the human, the human user starts to build up a bit of an emotional bond and is willing to continue interacting with the technology when things get a little bit rough. Right? So uh, this might be something that's useful in educational software. So you're trying to learn something. The system realizes that you're struggling and it says, I feel bad that you're having a hard time with this particular lesson. Why don't we slow things down a bit? Right? If the system verbally or visually advertises that it knows you're frustrated, it signals that it has an emotional response to your frustration, which is it feels bad. It went too quickly. Let me slow things down. I apologize. Perhaps you might be willing to continue on with the educational interaction with the system compared to one which is just blindly showing you the next lesson in the, the lesson plan. Uh, I put up Duolingo's owl here. Has anyone used Duolingo before? Yeah, so there's this little owl, the mascot, that's kind of happy when you do a good job and, you know, is there to kind of help you, help you along, right? There's this sort of face of Duolingo. Learning a foreign language can often be a frustrating thing. You've got to repeat things over and over again. It sort of helps to have someone there or something there that recognizes your progress or lack thereof. Okay. Another place uh, that effective computing is starting to be used is for therapeutic uh, software. This is an old article down here from NPR, but kind of an interesting one about using virtual reality to, uh, com uh, to uh, provide therapy for combat stress or PTSD. This is an approach known as exposure therapy. So uh, in this particular system, uh, they take someone who is suffering from PTSD, they put them inside a mock-up of a vehicle, and the veteran just sits in the vehicle until the veteran is able to calm themselves. So possibly just sitting in a vehicle might remind them uh, of a bad experience they had in a theater uh, of war. They're usually instrumented with physiological sensors that detect skin conductance and heart rate. If their heart rate remains elevated, then perhaps their uh, therapy session that day is to just sit in the in the generic vehicle and then go home again. 
The next day or the next therapy session when they come in, if their heart rate is able to slow, then there is a projection onto the front, wind, uh, uh, the front screen of the, a windshield of the vehicle that shows maybe a featureless desert. Perhaps uh, heart rate is elevated again in the veteran, and that's all that happens that day. Right? This is this idea of exposure therapy, also used for phobias, where you are very gradually exposed to the stressors that trigger, in this case, PTSD or your spider phobia or what, what have you. That idea has been around for a long time, but once you have uh, technology, you can do this in a much more incremental fashion. Right? You can ramp down the detail of the experience if the subject becomes stressed and then gradually ramp up the detail as they're able to remain uh, calm. It's an affective system because there's usually a visualization somewhere that's showing that the system knows what the current stress level is of the veteran. Right? So there isn't a, an acute owl or an anthropomorphic uh, machine in this case. It's just the signal that says we know that this might be a stressful situation for you. Here is the evidence that we know what your current stress level is, and things are not going to get any worse until your stress level drops, and then we will expose you to slightly more detail of this, this situation. Okay. So the third goal of uh, effective computing is if you can recognize emotion in your users, then you probably want to alter or adapt the interaction to maximize positive emotion or pleasure that the user actually enjoyed interacting with uh, the system. Like we've seen in HCI before, we can sort of break down this generic term pleasure or the user reporting that they enjoyed the interaction with the system and try and isolate certain aspects of the system that they, they enjoyed. And we start with the more obvious ones, which is physio pleasure, right? So this is the idea of ergonomics. So if there's a hardware component of the system, that the hardware is somehow elegant, it, fit, it fits snugly uh, in the hand, that there's something about the physical interaction that is, that is pleasurable. Social pleasure is that the device is kind of just there as a facilitator to allow you to interact with others. A lot of the satisfaction we get out of our everyday lives is interacting with, with others. Psycho pleasure is this idea that in the short term there might be something that is somewhat unpleasurable, like learning some new vocabulary for a foreign language. But at the end, looking back on the lesson, for example, if it was challenging but you learned something, it's much more pleasurable than something that was much too difficult or something that was too easy. Right? So we've talked about this a few times already. If your interactive system is trying to teach the user something or is trying to help them through a difficult experience, that it's doing it in this sort of incremental uh, fashion, right? That it's adapting and finding the sweet spot right at that point where the user is just challenged enough. And that's going to be a big, one of the biggest challenges for you in developing your educational system. How can you detect when your user is right at the edge of capability, right? There's nothing worse than a new game or a new application that forces you through a tutorial that's at a certain pace. Right? A tutorial that recognizes you know what you're doing should immediately disappear and let you move on. Right? So something that gets you, not only gets you to the point where you're right at the level of competence, but gets you there as quickly as possible usually leads to a pleasurable uh, interaction. Finally, and again we've mentioned this before, is this ideological pleasure. Right? Whatever the system is that you're interacting with, it sort of corresponds to your core values. Perhaps open software is very important to you, so using open software is a pleasurable experience rather than being forced into using uh, pay-per-use software. Perhaps the technology is green somehow, that it somehow meets with your higher level philosophical goals uh, in life. Okay, thus ends our discussion of affective computing and again the, the very subjective side of HCI. 
Okay, so we're going to move on now into looking outward and start to look at technologies. And we're going to start with traditional sort of input-output devices. And we're going to walk uh, in this series of lectures from 15 through 24 <coughs> through a series of technologies which are increasingly embedded in the physical world in a similar manner to the way that we are. We're going to end, as you can see here, with robots which have a body. They see the world not unlike how we see it. They push against the world, and they see how the world pushes back. Okay, we're going to start, however, with uh, traditional input output devices and tangible computing. We've spent a lot of time talking about interactive devices that broadcast to our visual system. They draw something on the screen that we see, or they broadcast to our auditory system. They play something on the speakers that we hear. But what about devices that can also broadcast to our other sensor modalities like touch, right? There aren't many of them yet. There is force feedback joysticks. We have uh, computer input devices that they get information from us through tactile interaction, right? Typing on keys, moving the mouse. But what about the other way? Technologies that push back against us. This is a screenshot from the X-Men movie. Does anybody remember this? With the moving pins, they would come up. It's kind of hard to see in this picture. They'd come up out of this surface and create a three-dimensional structure. You could, of course, put your hands on such a structure and, and actually feel that three-dimensional structure. So there are some prototypes of these kinds of moving pin uh, physical displays. What particular demographic might benefit from a moving pins display? Absolutely, right? Blind users, you can't broadcast to vision, you can broadcast to auditory, but the, the, of all of our five or six senses as you, as you count them, touch is one of the most under, is the underdog of all of our senses. Our skin does an amazing amount of information extraction from the, the physical world. What other output devices exist out there or that you could imagine that impinge upon our skin, things that you can actually feel, that are tangible. We've seen a couple already in this class. Does anybody remember the React table? So this music generation system where you put these blocks on the table. It's kind of a trivial example where obviously you feel the block that you're placing. There aren't many out there, but there, there are many in development. And I want to focus on one today. And the, re the reading for today is a research paper that was written uh, and reporting on this system called Ultra Haptics. I'll play the video for you uh, in a moment. I assigned the reading for today as the actual research paper. Um, it gets pretty technical and dense in the middle. Uh, the reading for today is just, I think, the first few sections, uh, the first few sections of that research paper. OK. I'm going to show you the video in a moment. Um, this particular subfield of HCI is known as tangible user interfaces. Tangible meaning there's usually an object there or something that you can touch. One of the things that's interesting, as you'll see in the ultra haptic system, is that you can touch something that isn't actually there. And they manage this using a pretty sophisticated uh, system that interacts with the physical world. So as I play the video, pay attention to the way they create the illusion that the user is actually touching something when that thing is not actually there. OK. Interactive surfaces are now common in everyday life. They allow users to walk up and use them with no instruction. However, current methods for providing tactile feedback require the user to cover up the visual content by touching the display or attach devices to their hands. We present Ultra Haptics a system that provides mid-air haptic feedback and requires no contact with either tools, attachments, or the surface itself. 
Ultra Haptics uses a phased array of ultrasound transducers to create tactile focal points in mid-air. The array is driven by a stack of five driver boards. Which I'm sorry, would you guys mind just closing the two doors in the back there? Thank you. Cheers. <clears throat> Thanks. To receive emission, the array is driven by a stack of five driver boards which receive emission patterns from a PC. The user's hands are tracked by a leap motion controller and the haptic feedback is projected through an acoustically transparent display directly onto the user's bare hands. There are four steps to our unique focusing method. First, we define a large volume around the transducer array within which we will model the ultrasound field. Then, we position positive control points where we want to form focal points. These tell the system to generate the highest intensity ultrasound possible at these locations. They are then surrounded with null control points. These have the opposite effect, telling the system to generate the lowest intensity ultrasound at these locations. Finally, the phase delay and amplitude are calculated for each transducer in the array to create an acoustic field that matches the control point. This simulation illustrates the acoustic field as we move up from the transducer array. Colour represents phase and brightness represents intensity. At a height of 20 centimetres, a focal point is formed. Above, the ultrasound defocuses once more. Similarly, this simulation shows five discrete focal points being formed at the same time. By varying the tactile properties of focal points, such as the frequency, they can be made to feel different from each other. In this scenario, a tactile information layer is created above the display. By moving their hand over the map, the user can feel the population density of a city. The frequency of a focal point represents the density in that area. Here, focal points are created above elements of a music player interface. This allows a user to locate themselves on the interface without looking. Tapping the focal point above the button starts and stops the music. The focal point above the volume slider can be grabbed. At this point, it pulses to inform the user that the system has recognised their grasp. The focal point can then be slid up and down to change the volume. These are just a few of the applications that become possible with the ultra haptic system. Okay. Uh, looks like a bit of a magic trick to start with. So unfortunately I can't show you or have you feel what this feels like, but I think you get the idea, right? They're reaching into this system and they actually feel the volume knob between their fingers and when they grasp it, the knob clicks or gives a little bit of a pulse to show that you have successfully grabbed the knob, right? And you can see that visually, the green circles turned red. How does this work? Let's start with the transducer array. So transduction is turning one physical phenomenon into another one. In this case, it's taking electricity and turning it into ultrasound. So ultrasound, these are pressure waves that are coming up from that array. So each one of those little speakers, if you like, you can think of them as speakers, are, emit, are emitting a pressure wave. That's what's coming up from the bottom of the device. Or I think in the last example here, the device was uh, pointed downward. What happens? So what happens then at the point between the user's fingers? That's right, the focal point, right, of high-density ultrasound. How do they create that focal point? 
Um, I mean, if I want to know, like, you could feel vibrations of something that are really low frequency. Um, Absolutely. So what's happening is actually vibration. You are feeling the ultrasound pressure waves or the vibration in the air. It's a vibration, but it feels like you're touching something. I haven't tried it myself. I don't know what it actually feels. It probably feels like something that is vibrating slightly. It doesn't resist your grasp, obviously, because there's no physical object there, but it sort of tricks your brain, not unlike some of the optical illusions we saw, into believing that there is an object there. How does the transducer array create those focal points? They could create them at arbitrary points in the three-dimensional space. They showed you that they could create multiple points. They could also create negative focal points or null places where there is sort of a, a vacuum. You don't feel anything. So by putting those lack of vibrations around that point where you feel a vibration, it, it, it exaggerates the vibration at exactly that point. How do they do that? How do you go from this two-dimensional array that's emitting pressure waves to a focused point of vibration? So these are literally waves, right? Pressure waves. What happens when waves collide? Remember, there are multiple waves that are being sent up by different elements in this array. What happens when two waves of water collide? It amplifies. Absolutely, right? So if you're on the beach and you're watching two breaks that are coming in uh, at an angle where they touch, if you look at the height of that new wave, it's usually about twice the height of the two that touch, right? That's positive interference. What else is possible? You get them to amplify and then they cancel out. They can also cancel out. You can get negative interference, which are those null points. So that array is sending out waves. So imagine you had pumps out in the ocean and you could send electricity to those pumps that would create waves of different amplitude and different frequency and you were setting those pumps to create a, a collision at a particular point in the ocean where the wave would be much higher. That's exactly what they're doing in their phased array here. It's a phased array, meaning there are pressure waves coming out at different phases. So wave interaction depends on frequency, phase, and amplitude. Are they saying they're only modifying the phase? I think they, I think they said a fixed amplitude. You'd have to go back and listen to the, the video. Did they say fixed amplitude? Yeah, I mean, that would make sense because, like, if two things are in phase... Okay, so if it's perfectly in phase, it's going to double the amplitude. If Absolutely. If it's not perfectly in phase, it'll just increase a little bit. And if they're at, like, an opposite phase, it'll cancel out. So it has to be, like, doing different amounts. But most likely doubling the phase each time because... Right. I'm pretty sure you could create arbitrary points with just changing the phase. I don't know if they change frequency and amplitude as well. Okay. There was also a good friend of ours in that video, the Leap Motion device. What was Leap doing in this case? Fingers in hand. Tracking the fingers, right? So perhaps you could create a new conceptual object called a sticky button, or I could actually press on something. And if I double click on it, it will follow my finger, right? It's stuck to the tip of my finger. They didn't actually do that in the demo, but you could do that. How would you have to combine the Leap Motion device with the phased array to create that illusion that there is something stuck to my finger? What's the feedback loop that you would need here? You just move the focal point as the um, points to Absolutely. Right. So we start with the XYZ coordinate of my fingertip. We Leap gives us that. Right. We know that we want to, to produce a focal point at that position. We go back in and do some machine learning or we do some transformation that will output different phases to the different arrays or to the different uh, ultrasonic emitters that will produce a focal point at exactly that point. The moment I move my finger, the position changes, the desired position of the focal point changes, which means the phases are also going to, to change. Okay. Again, as in everything in HCI, whether this will become a killer app, who knows. But it's an interesting 
completely new kind of interface, right? You can manipulate objects and feel those objects in three-dimensional space even though the objects are not actually there. Okay, so why do this, right? Why tangible user interfaces, TUIs rather than GUIs, right? One of the reasons why, and this is why skin is one of the underdogs of our sensor modalities, is that the moment you physically manipulate an object, you bring your other senses to bear on it, right? So when you grasp an object, you usually also visually attend to it and observe what you're doing to that object. In the ultra-haptic system, this doesn't quite work because there is no object there to look at. But if you're looking at your fingers as you're trying to grasp an object in the ultra-haptic system, your visual sense actually will help you here. How? Remember, all the objects in ultra-haptics are invisible. I'm moving around and, oh, I find that there's something here, and I'm trying to grasp it. And I'm looking at my fingers as I'm trying to grasp it. What do I get out of my visual sense in this case? in addition to what I'm getting out of my tactile sense. Kind of like an indication of what you do there. Like, if the play button, why would you just touch that and move the slider? Why would you just move it up and down? Okay, so I can look at the visual projection down on the two-dimensional surface, right? So imagine we turn that off. There is none of that. And we just tell someone to put their hand into this box and feel around and report back to us what objects are in that space and tell us about those objects. How does looking at your fingers help here? Absolutely. Right, it's again almost like a visual illusion, right? You don't see any object there, but you're doing this and you're actually realizing that you're manipulating a sphere or maybe you're manipulating a cube. Maybe you have unintentionally grabbed the cube and rotated the cube. You're not seeing a cube, or you're not seeing a sphere or a cube, but your brain is filling that in, right? We just finished this series of lectures about how the mind tends to fill in details that aren't there, right? Remember Gestalt perception. You've manipulated small objects that are spheres or rectangles or cubes for 20 or 30 years, and you've seen the object, but you've also seen how your fingers react as you move them around the surface of the, the object, right? So when we're physically manipulating an object, we're bringing our other, our other senses, vision or maybe auditory as well, to bear to learn about this object and how we can interact with it. Is it sticky? Does it stick to my finger? Can I rotate it? Is it movable? Maybe I grab it and try and move it and it doesn't move, right? My fingers slip off the edge of the object, right? All of those sorts of intuitions you can build up by physically manipulating an object. What else happens when you're physically manipulating an object? How else do you bring your visual and or auditory senses to bear on the problem? So imagine I put this ultra-haptic system in front of you and we turned off the 2D display and we played this game. Tell me about the objects inside this space. What would you want to see or what would you want to hear that would tell you something about the objects in this space? All right, let me give you a few more ideas here to get you, get you going. Maybe in ultra-haptics you can't sense temperature, but you might be able to sense texture and softness. Uh, we hear how it moves across another surface. You could also bring in an auditory track to heighten the illusion. Perhaps there are objects that are sitting on a surface and you're trying to pull them across that surface, and when you do, a sound is emitting that tells you something again about that that object, right? How does it resist when you grasp it, right? Is it soft? Is it rigid? Can you twist it? Can you flatten it? Uh, what, else, what else is it connected to? Can you pull it? Is it glued to the ground or not? There's a huge amount of information we build up about physical objects in our environment as young children by not just looking at them, by 
physically manipulating them. Um, in developmental psychology, again, the study of children, uh, one universal with yet very young children is any object they can grab, they put it in their mouths. First of all, because it might be something they can eat, but you can also bite on something, uh, feel it with your tongue. You can learn a lot about an object by putting it in your mouth, and that's what children tend to do. As they're bringing the object towards their mouths, they're also seeing it and hearing something if it makes a sound. And they're starting to associate tactile information with visual and auditory information about that, that object. When you physically manipulate an object, rather than trying to rotate it with a mouse on a screen, you bring your physical skills to bear. Right? If you've ever worked with uh, CAD software and you're trying to rotate objects to a particular orientation in three-dimensional space, it's incredibly difficult. Imagine you were to connect ultra haptics with a CAD system where whatever object you're creating, you can reach into the, the space and just turn it yourself. Right? It might make design a lot a lot easier. Uh, much easier, at least for me, to sketch with a pen than it is with a, with a mouse. If you tried to sign your name with a mouse, it's kind of difficult. Okay, some reasons why we might want to try and create tangible user interfaces. Here's another example from the subfield of tangible computing. This is a, a fun one called illuminating clay. There is a physical object in this case, and it's malleable. It's clay. And we'll watch the video and then sort of think about how, what the applications for this, such a system might, might be. Illuminating clay allows users to simultaneously interact with both physical and computational representations of the landscape. Here we see two collaborators preparing a landscape model to be analyzed with the system. A Vivid 900 Minolta laser scanner allows the topography of the model to be captured at a rate of 1 hertz. A Mitsubishi LCD projector casts the results of the landscape analysis back onto the surfaces of the model. The work table comprises of a smooth white surface and a rotating platform onto which a landscape model is placed. We experimented with different types of landscape modeling materials. Plasticine with a ductile fibrous core allows the model to maintain the required topography. The area around the platform is illuminated with a library of analysis functions that can be selected at will. The remaining edges of the work surface are used to project cross-sections of the model terrain. The scan cast mode projects analysis functions onto the model. These include variables such as slope variation and curvature, shadowing and solar radiation, water flow and land erosion. The cut cast mode allows users to add surfaces for projection without affecting the simulation results. CAD cast allows the user to construct three-dimensional topographical models. This system allows any object from the user's work environment to be used as an input to the system without the need for tagging, tethering, or demarcation. The interface provides a simple means for three-dimensional display where the tangible immediacy of physical models can be combined with the dynamic capabilities of computational simulation. Okay, again, this, here's a system still awaiting its killer app. One of, the things, uh, one of the things I like about this is also it was one of the first examples of augmented reality, right? We have the physical object, and then that physical object is augmented with a real-time digital projection onto it. You could imagine using this for civil engineering projects or um, uh, other environmental engineering projects. What else might be the killer app here? So one of the things that Illuminating Clay is trying to do is help you visualize some aspect of the physical object, which is change in slope, better than you would if you just looked directly at the object. Right? You can kind of see the slope or the structure, the topography of a lump of clay, but if you project on top of it, you get a much more detailed sense of the structure of that, that system.
probably know what you're thinking of, but I mean, um, a design engineer could take that, create a physical model, and do their stress analysis based on their model. Stress analysis, right? So maybe I'm, not, I'm using the clay or I'm using something else to build a model bridge. And as I'm building the bridge, as I'm building it in real time, I can see where the stress points are, right? If I don't add some additional uh, structural support here, this is where the bridge is going to break. You can do this now with engineering so software, but usually it presupposes you make the structure and then you submit it to finite element analysis and it gives you back a report of where the stresses are. Imagine you could see that sort of information in real time as you're creating the mock-up of a civil structure, right? That might be an interesting application of a future version of this kind of system. Okay, last one we're going to look at today. This is the interactive workbench. This is a little bit like illuminating clay and a little bit like um, and a little bit like the ultra haptic system. But unlike those two systems, this system is really going to push back. So the ultra haptic system kind of pushes back in a minor sense. It's able to emit a vibration that pushes slightly against the skin. Can we do a little bit better than, than that? The actuated workbench consists of an 8x8 array of electromagnets. It uses magnetic attraction and repulsion to move magnetic objects two-dimensionally on a flat surface. Here we can see a magnet moving in stepwise Manhattan motion. Here we see an object moving in a smooth circular pattern. Although the array of electromagnets is fixed, the system can create smooth motion by varying the strength of the electromagnetic fields. In addition to magnets, the electromagnetic array can move any small ferromagnetic object, such as a paperclip. Here the user controls the puck's motion with a trackball. Smaller objects can be moved much faster, though their motion is not always so smooth. Magnets of different sizes and shapes behave differently in the system's magnetic fields. This stack of small magnets jumps around whimsically. We use computer vision as a preliminary object tracking technology. Here the user records a path by moving the puck on the surface, and the system then replays that path through magnetic actuation. The blue projection around the puck is a graphical visualization of the strength of each adjacent magnetic field. Here is an example application intended to teach users about physics. The red projected area on the surface represents a zone of attractive force, while the blue area represents repulsive force. The user can feel these forces by lightly holding the puck in different areas of the board. When the user releases the puck, it flies to the red zone of the board to which it is attracted. Magnetic drawing toys are effective for visualizing the actuated workbench's magnetic fields. A magnadoodle allows us to see the fields used to trace the smooth circular path shown at the beginning of this video. The Dapper Dan toy lets us see the magnetic activity in the movements of iron filings on the surface. The actuated workbench can be used to control the planchette in a Ouija board game. Another good one for Halloween, right? <clears throat> like other robust systems, such as the Diamond Touch, presented by Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs in WIS 2001, the actuated workbench works even when set on fire. 
You can see what HCI grad students get up to in the research labs when the professors go home at night. Okay. Aside from the fact that it doesn't catch on fire, or only part of it catches on fire, what might be the benefit of a system like this? Aside from the G whiz factor. Well, there's also the parlor tricks you have with the Ouija board. Yes, that's right. You can amaze your friends. That's true. Other than that. Sorry. You can kind of do it with your desk, or you can do it with the blackboard, or you can kind of get information out of the way that you're the one who starts talking to you with the bottom of your head. So you can have the bottom of your head. You can turn it away from your head. That's a good idea, right? So you can manipulate objects, so you can make this a, a more tangible device and then tell it to move everything out of the way. It could automatically clean up the workspace for you. If you did a lot of work and combined the haptic sensor with this, you could do like dis, uh, dismantling a bomb from a distance by moving magnetic things and pulling wires apart. That's an interesting idea, right? So anything that requires fine manual dexterity, and again, that might be something you want to do at a distance. Bomb diffusing is also something that takes years, as you can imagine, of careful training, right? And often that training is watching an expert do it, and you're watching from a distance, and then the instructor says, now you try, right? How might this change that kind of interaction? Aside from being able to manually do something at a distance. Well, said you could record things, so you wouldn't actually need a person there. You could just watch the movements. You could watch the movements. So an expert could record something on the table, and then the novice could play it back and watch it, but even better than watching it. You can feel it, right? It makes manual instruction, so teaching how to, people to do something with their hands, it makes it tangible, right? So what, you know, learning about elect electromagnetic forces and all that, it's kind of intangible, this abstract thing with fields and forces and so on. For some people, it's too abstract. But if you're holding this device and seeing magnetic fields and feeling the way in which the object is being pulled under your fingers makes it tangible, right? So imagine any task like that where you're learning how to draw or perform some fine motor task. Perhaps you're trying to learn how to uh, draw Japanese kanji characters. It's very difficult to do when you watch someone do it from a distance and then you reach in and try and reproduce what they do. This can, under the cer certain circumstances, make it feel like your hand is on the hand of the instructor and the instructor is moving your hand through the process, right? It's a very new and exotic form of scaffolding, right? Perhaps as the instructor or as the system feels that you're becoming more proficient at this manual task, scaffold starts to be removed. What would it mean to remove scaffolding in this system, in this particular application of the novice holding the instructor's hand, or vice versa? You have to reduce it yourself, right? So you turn off the instructor's forces on the object, and now you're just moving the object. But remember that with scaffolding, we always try and want to try and remove it as gradually as possible. So you can maybe have it so if you got the button get stuck, you can move it for a while because it'll drag you to the next move. Maybe, right? So you stop moving, and the forces that are coming from the instructor are increased, right? So the instructor the amount of control that the two people have over the direction of travel of the object is a balance. It's a sum of those forces. The forces I'm exerting and the forces that the magnets which recorded the instructor's movements are applying. It's a sum of those two forces. As I signal uh, loss of competence or I don't know what to do next, the instructor's hand appears and helps. And as I exhibit the fact that I'm getting better at the task, the forces applied by the magnets gradually become less and less. And if you do it gradually enough, I start to do it, and I don't even realize that the training wheels have been taken off. Right? OK, uh, we will stop there. You have a quiz due tonight, and we will move on to ubiquitous computing uh, on Wednesday. Thanks very much.